Thank you. Thank you. That's really nice of you. Well, just to get the ball rolling, um, uh, welcome back to Arizona. Thank you. Because you, I know you spent a lot of time here as a kid and went to yeah, I, college. Yeah, uh, uh, I grew up in, I was born in Alabama, and then I grew up in, uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska, and then I moved to Lake Havasu in uh, high school. And uh, I was in Lake Havasu when it was really small, uh, about 6,000 people. And it was just absolutely an incredible place to grow up. And uh, uh, it's gotten a lot bigger now. It feels to me like a little mini phoenix. So when I go back, I'm like that like kind of old guy that goes, yeah, you know, when I was a kid, this place was great, you know. Uh, so, but uh, yeah, so I know Arizona very well. I've got a lot of uh, family here in Phoenix. And I've got, uh, of course, my family back in Lake Havasu. And, uh, I went to college for uh, well, it was a, about a semester and a half at the University of Arizona, so <laughs> I have some connections around here. <laughs> so keeping on the Arizona theme, then um, I, first of all, I had to ask since I get one question, right? I had to ask about Tombstone. What about Tombstone? Yes, right. one of my absolute all-time favorite movies, Tombstone. Woo! So. Uh, we were talking a lot about villains and stuff too. That the, the guy next to the big guy is always more interesting. So Darth Vader is more interesting than the Emperor, and Johnny Ringo was one of the best villains. As like, but he wasn't the main guy. But he was way more interesting than Curly Bill. No offense to Curly Bill, Powers Booth, amazing guy. But Johnny Ringo was the man. Well, you know, that was a very interesting experience doing that movie. Uh, first of all, uh, Kevin Jar who wrote the original script, which was uh, about 130 pages, which is a long hey. movie, uh, wrote a really brilliant script. So every actor in town wanted to be a piece of it, uh, wanted to be a part of it. And uh, I got um, sent the script, and uh, my agent, who was Ed Lamato at the time, who was a very big agent, and Mel Gibson and Michelle Pfeiffer, and, um, a lot, a, lot, a lot of very, very big people asked me, you know, if, I, if I'd be interested in playing any of the roles. So I read through it and immediately said I wanted to play Doc Holliday. Because actors know, you know, <laughs> what the good roles are. And uh, Kurt was already cast. And uh, uh, they said, well, they thought they are probably going to go a different direction with that, with that, uh, that uh, uh, you know, that part might not be available. And then, and then they said, would you be interested in any other part? And I said, Johnny Ringo, right away. Because as an actor, you can tell, for me, as an actor, you can tell uh, that's really, you know, what the good roles are. When roles come up in Hollywood, you know, actors look at them and they buy for them and they, they say, you know, they, they, they know a good, a, a good character when they see one. So um, Kevin um, was very... Uh, smart and very, uh, he did a great job uh, with the vernacular at the time, with the law dogs and the uh, all right longer and all that kind of stuff was great. Uh, but he was very rigid about the way he wanted it shot, the way he wanted it, and everything was, you know, just perfectly uh, done to that time. And it was a much grayer movie than what you see. The movie was, uh, the Earps weren't the heroes so much. The uh, cowboys kind of, you know, had owned that area, and all of a sudden the Earps came in and started like, you know, pushing them around a little bit. And um, so it was a much grayer story. And in real life, it was also much grayer. Actually, the Earps, uh, you know, there were a lot of people at that time that felt the Earps went down and just massacred those three guys. Those three guys were drunk are, you know, hung over, and they're trying to get on their horses to get out of town, and they had three six-shooters between them, and instead of having six bullets, you carry five bullets in case of a misfire, so you always have five bullets in here. So they had 15 bullets between them, and the herbs went down, and uh, all four of them had, you know, double, uh, double six guns, and uh, Doc Holliday had the shotgun. So they went down there and killed them all, and uh, there was an inquiry at the time uh, about whether the Earps were going to be tried for murder. 
and Doc Holliday were going to be tried for murder. And it was kind of like the um, kind of like the O.J. Simpson case of that time. You know, there were a lot of people that felt one way and a lot of people that felt another way. So, um, but that doesn't go over so well, you know, in movies. You know, and uh, what happened was uh, uh, that director uh, uh, who wrote it got fired. And um, they brought in a, because of the way he wanted to shoot it, and um, they brought in a, a, in a um, another director who was very good visually. His name was George Cosmatos, and he had directed Cobra, which was like a uh, Stallone movie, Leviathan. It's movies that looked really, really good. So what we had is we had a great script, we had great actors, and we had then finally somebody that would, would make the movie look really good. And uh, uh, a lot of stuff got cut out of the movie. A lot of stuff got cut out of the movie. And um, mostly the stuff about, you know, the fact that it was a grayer story. There weren't really heroes. There weren't really good guys and bad guys. For instance, Johnny Ringo never shot a priest. That just, just came out because they wanted to have a bad guy. You know, and that was not originally when I went to Tucson to shoot the movie. That was not in the script. But once, once, once Kevin got fired, uh, they Disney, you know, came in and made some changes along with uh, uh, Kurt, uh, who helped uh, keep that movie uh, together. And um, Johnny Ringo really was not really known for anything other than being uh, drunk, very smart, very bookish, uh, new Latin. And uh, he uh, called out uh, uh, Wider at one point and said to a gunfight. And Wider declined. And I don't know exactly what the circumstances were, uh, but uh, what happened was when we shot the movie, Kurt Russell, who's the star of the movie, you know, didn't want, you know, this guy comes out and challenges him to a gunfight. Kurt didn't want to be like, nah, it's okay, I don't want to, you know, because he's the hero of the movie, and it's very understandable, you know, that, 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 that he would not want to do that. So what he did was kind of changed it, that he didn't, he said, I'm not healed. And again, there's that vernacular that Kevin wrote throughout the entire movie, I mean, which is just incredible. Healed, meaning he didn't have his uh, pistols on, he didn't have his six-shooter six on. So that's the way they handle that scene, that scene. But that movie, at, and, and at the movie at the time, was not reviewed particularly well. It was reviewed like you know, 50-50. You know, it did not make a lot of money. It caught, I, we made it for about, I think we made it for about 60 million, and I think it made about 60 million back. At now, after 30 years later, I'm sure Disney is is just making money off of it. But Westerns these days, um, you know, they don't make them anymore. They're very expensive to make, very expensive to make because of all the uh, period stuff. The horses, the clothes, the silverware, the everything, you know, it's got to be period. They don't sell well overseas, and the kids just aren't interested in them anymore as compared to, um, you know, things flying through the sky and things blowing up and, uh, you know, uh, Michael Bay, you know. <laughs> They're interested in Michael Bay these days. So uh, that, it was a very fun experience because there were so many great, great, great actors on that movie. And uh, uh, I really enjoyed it and had a great time making it. We made it um, right outside of Tucson in a little town called Mescal, which was uh, uh, a town that was built, not a town, but it was a, basically a set that was built for uh, the old cowboy movies. And we stayed in Tucson and drove out and shot Mescal. And uh, um, I never, you know, after seeing the review, I mean, the thing about it also, too, and I'm not sure that, that, that Kurt would necessarily agree with this uh, or Powers, but <clears throat> the movie really, that, Kurt was the hero, and Powers was the bad guy. Okay, and me and Val were kind of like their, you know, their underneath guys, you know. And by the time uh, they gave it to Disney and they got done cutting it, 
it really kind of turned out that Val and I had really kind of stole the show, to tell you the truth, you know, and I don't, I don't, I have a lot of, I have a lot of respect for both of those actors, a lot of respect, and so I have a little trouble saying that, I'm not sure that's exactly what happened, but um, people ask me a lot about uh, Val Kilmer, uh, a lot of people here he's really difficult to work with, and uh, and that just have, I've done two, two films with him now, and that just is not the case. It's certainly not the case with me. And uh, just to give you an example, Curtis, I mean, uh, Val is very, uh, like, he wants it right, right. He doesn't suffer fools well, um, and, and either do I, you know. I mean, if it's not right, then, like, I'm, gonna, it's, I'm not going to be happy about it. And it's the same with him. And so, to give you an example, uh, 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 Val and I went out while they were shooting uh, a day before we shot that final scene, the gunfight scene under the oak tree. And uh, Val and I basically choreographed that scene and we worked that scene out over and over and over and over again. And we really came up with the idea of like instead of a guy standing here and a guy standing here, you know, and doing our lines, you know we were actually going to be right next to each other. One of the reasons was because a lot of times in the old days, back there when they would have those gunfights, they would be like 20 feet apart from each other and they couldn't hit each other, you know. They'd keep shooting and missing and shooting and missing, you know. So we decided to do it real close like that and do that whole thing where we were turning. And we had that choreographed down to the point where I knew I was going to be shooting my gun off even though I had a bullet that's gone through my brain. And so we re really rehearsed that scene and uh, worked very hard on it, uh, so we had it down. And uh, there's a moment in that scene that I feel maybe is like the greatest, for me, as an actor, over the 30 or 40 years that I've been acting, um, is kind of what my favorite moment as an actor. And that's when um, he says, well, I'll be your Huckleberry. And I say, you know, like, my fight's not with you. And he says, well, yeah, it is with me. And I, and I, I look at him, and I kind of realize what he's saying, and I get a look in my eye. And that little look in my eye before I say, all right, Lugger, let's do it, you know. To me, it was like kind of my favorite moment on film uh, out of my entire career. So. Yes, sir. What was your experience like working with James Cameron? Well, you know, Jim, I wouldn't be sitting here, you know, if it hadn't been for Jim. And uh, I worked with Jim three times, really. I did a little bit in T2. That, uh, but, uh, I mean, in, um, in uh, yeah, T2? Yeah, T2. Um, you know, when I started working with Jim, um, you know, he, well, he's very young. I mean, he just turned 50. And uh, so we are kind of the same age, really. I'm not quite 50 yet, but uh, he, we're, we're, we're he was, it was great. I mean, it was great. I mean, when we did The Terminator, it was for him, to me, it seemed like he, it was like, for him, it was like a kid in, you know, in a candy jar, you know, I mean, in our candy store, you know. And, uh, I had great experiences with Jim um, through Aliens, although I was not cast originally in, the, in, in Aliens. I was very disappointed. Uh, but uh, they cast another actor who ran into some troubles over in England, and they replaced him. I got a call from Gail Hur. I, I was disappointed that I wasn't in it, because I thought I'd done such a good job for him in The Terminator. And there were some roles in it that I thought I could play. But uh, he didn't cast me. But I got a call from Gail Hurd. I was in Los Angeles. I remember exactly where I was in Los Angeles. And I got a call from Gail. And she said, Mike, let's Gail Hurd. And I said, hi, Gail. Uh, how's it going over there? She said, OK, how's your pa is your passport in order? <laughs> and I said, yes. And she said, OK, uh, I want you to get on a, a, a plane. And uh, we want you to play uh, um, Hicks. And I. You know, you know, I hadn't read the script for a while, but I knew it was uh, something special. So I basically got a call on a Friday night in Los Angeles and was on the set Monday morning. Uh, 
And I also, you know, again, uh, Aliens, very complicated movie. Jim did have some trouble with, uh, we shot at Pinewood Studios, which is the big studios over in, uh, big studio over in England. And if you were going to use the studio, you have to use a certain amount of their technicians. And they were some of these uh, guys that were a little bit older, uh, you know, didn't have the energy that uh, Jim had, certainly, or that uh, me and Bill Paxton and, uh, you know, <laughs> had and stuff, you know. And they moved a little slower and they had to stop for their tea breaks. And <laughs> Jim, Jim showed a little... Um, uh, uh, Disappointment a little bit. Uh, he, he was a little angry with with that group at that time. Um, then I did The Abyss with him, which was a really really difficult movie to make, and I was not around for the uh, uh, any problems on that movie. Um, I was underwater for uh, just uh, hours and hours and hours, and um, sat in that in that. Uh, submersible in between shots where I sat in a submersible and like read scripts, you know, for <laughs> upcoming things, you know, because I was in it for so long. But the thing about Jim Cameron is, I'll give you two stories about him. One is that like how hard he works, you know, and how much respect I have for him. And um, uh, after I'd done the Terminator and finished the Terminator, it was like on a Friday, and of course it was the last day of shooting and you shoot until whatever, I got a call from Gail on Saturday, and they had some film cut together. Jim, like other directors who were always like, oh, the actors can't come see dailies, the actors can't come see dailies, you know, they'll change the way that they act, which back then was the way that it always was, which is just totally foolish. But so Jim used to always like, come see dailies, come see dailies, you know, I want you to see a tech noir. So he had tech noir, he had tech noir cut together you know, in a, in a rough cut, and he wanted me to see it. So I came down there uh, to this uh, little uh, place there we're working on it, and uh, met Gail, and she said Jim's in the other room. And of course, they weren't married at the time. They were courting, I guess. And uh, I went in, and Jim was sitting there, and he was like writing. I mean, this is the following day. I mean, I was like exhausted. I was like just like, totally exhausted, 11-week shoot. We shot until like four o'clock in the morning. You know, this was like four o'clock in the afternoon the next day, and he and he was in there and he was just writing away and he had a, some Cheetos and he was like eating Cheetos and writing and eating Cheetos. And I'm Jim, and he's like like this and I'm like it's Jim, Jim, it's Michael. Oh, hey, Michael. You know, blah, blah, blah. So uh, I said, Jim, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> I mean. I just couldn't imagine, you know, I would have thought he would have taken a week off and gone to Hawaii or something like that, you know. And he said, well, I'm working on this treatment for uh, Aliens 2, and uh, I have to get it in and so on and so forth by a certain date. So he was, the following day, he was working on what became Aliens. And, um, I mean, that's kind of how hard he works. Another example of that is when I was, there used to be an observation window in the, uh, in the uh, tanks that we shot at in uh, Gaffney, South Carolina. And uh, he, uh, unlike uh, the actors, had to stay underwater at, at, at 30 feet for a long, for, he'd be down there for like 12 hours at a time. And we'd be down there for two, three hours, four hours at a time. And, you know, as a, a lot of people know, anybody who's a diver knows, you can't stay underwater at certain levels without uh, having uh, the possibility of, of getting the bends by staying underwater too long at a certain uh, level and then coming up too fast. So Jim had to, what they call, hang off the line. So there was a line, there was like a you know, thing, and he'd have to come up like 10 feet and wait 10 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever it was. Then he'd come up another 10 feet and wait 10 or 15 minutes and then he'd come to the top. So that's 30 minutes of his day that I guess he figured was wasted. So one day, one day I was like, you know, I'd, I'd done my thing and I was like, like bl blurry eyed and like, you know, I was just like, you know, it's like hard work. And uh, I was walking by observation window and I see Jim and he had that uh, helmet that he would be able to speak to us with, but he didn't have the, um, he didn't have the suit that the, the, the helmet's connected into. He just wore that thing and it really 
banged up his shoulders and they got all raw and and uh, he had a lot of had a lot of trouble with that. And they had to devise these pads for him or whatever. So anyway, I mean this is like four, 12, 14 hour day or whatever, and I'm just like wasted. And I'm walking by the observation window and I look at Jim, and Jim is hanging off the line, and he's hanging off the line upside down to take the pressure of the helmet off, and he's got an underwater monitor. And he's looking at an underwater monitor. And the next day, I said to Jim, "What? What? what I saw you walk by the window. What were you looking at? Dailies. <laughs> <laughs> Dailies from the day before. You know. So that's how hard Jim Cameron worked. You know. And uh, so when you have somebody like that, who's that hardworking and really that brilliant, and uh, I think that Jim now probably." from when I speak to him, when I talk to him, is much more interested in the ocean than he is in um, uh, making movies. I could be wrong, but I get the feeling he's, you know, kind of making Avatar 2 and 3, and he's going to take that money, and he's going to, you know, you know, do more with the underwater stuff. He's really our generation, Jacques Cousteau. Uh, there's Ballard, or the guy that... Uh, uh, found, found the uh, Titanic and Jim and Jim Jim's been deeper than anybody else by himself and they go down there and they find like uh, little animals and plankton and stuff that they've never seen before and he's really an explorer and uh, he's really a genius and uh, so um, I've heard some stories that he's difficult to work with um, in my case when I worked with him very early in his career that was never the case he was never difficult to work with at all. Um, he, uh, uh, the, I always say this, and the, the only thing that he's ever said to me, you know, that I found a little bit uh, abrupt, you know, was after a take one time, you know, and, you know, I mean, when you're making a movie, it's like, you know, you charge and you're trying to get stuff done. He came up to me after a movie, and he walked up to me, and, he's, and he said, that's, Michael, that's exactly what I don't want, you know. <laughs> and I said, all right, Jim, uh, you're the fuck. You, you're the fucking star here. Yeah. Uh, you can do everybody's job better than, than them, but you can't play me, you know? You can't play Reese, so, you know, give me a line reading and I'll do it, you know? And he did, and uh, that's about as, uh, you know, that's about as, as tough as it ever got uh, for me with Jim. And later on in my career, I did a, a movie, uh, which was um, uh, uh, Grindhouse with uh, Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez. and. Uh, uh, I decided that after that I was going to make my own Grindhouse movie. So I wrote a script in 12 days and did all of my pre-production while I was writing the script and then I rolled into a 12-day shoot and I shot this movie called The Victim. And I have to admit that like, I've worked with some tough directors before but I was like, I was like, I was like Cameron and Billy Friedkin and Michael Bay all together, wrapped up together on their worst day, you know. <laughs> that was me as a director. So I can understand the pressures, and uh, uh, I have to say on my, on my movie, though, like, nobody quit, nobody got fired. We ended up with a nice little movie. Uh, I made, uh, Jim made his movie for six and a half million dollars 35 years ago. I made mine for 100000 he had 12 weeks, I did mine in 12 days. So, uh, you know, it, it was different, but at the same time. The short, the short part, the short story, or the long story. <laughs> All right. Well, I got a call from my agent again, Ed Lamato, and uh, I was told that I wasn't going to be involved in Alien Three, which was a great disappointment to me. Not only, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I just thought I would be because I lived, and the little girl lived, and I thought, you know, we would be part of three. I mean, why wouldn't we be, you know? <laughs> so I was very, very disappointed in it. And anyway, I went on and I was making another movie and I was making a movie with uh, Rafaela De Laurentiis, uh, who is Dino De Laurentiis' daughter. And uh, she was producing this little movie I was doing with Patsy Kenzin. And um, I, uh, I was on the set and uh, Rafaela came up to me and she said, hey, Michael, I just saw you over in England. 
And I said, well, what are you talking about? She goes, I, I was out, out of Pinewood, and they're shooting Aliens 3, and they had, I saw your character there, which was Hicks, and his, you know, I said, well, what are you talking, you know, what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, I saw it, and saw that, the chest was all blown out. <laughs> and I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> So I called up my agent and I said that, you know, I'd spoken to Raffaella and uh, it looks like they killed off Hicks with a, like, you know, one of those things, one of the aliens blowing out of his chest. And my, my agent, Ed, said, well, um, hopefully they didn't use your likeness because they can't do that without your likeness, my face, which is going to which is going to become a very important thing in the future. They're going to be making movies with people's faces and that's and computers, and that's, uh, that's gonna come a lot faster than, 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 than you think. Um, but anyway, um, so we got a hold of Fox and we said, uh, Michael doesn't want the alien to come out of his, and Jim didn't want it either. See, at this point, Jim moved on. Jim, is, Jim, Jim did not create that movie. Um, actually, David Geiler and Walter Hill created the movie, and then we got Ridley Scott to do the first one, which was great. Jim took a different take on his and made the second one, which was great. And David Fincher obviously did the third one. And uh, Fox said, well, you know, we've done this and so on and so forth. And um, they offered me some money to, uh, and I said, "There, under no circumstances, you can't give me enough money to have Hicks go out that way. So just forget about it, you know. So... Uh, then they said, okay, well, they wouldn't do that. Um, they, um, uh, I got a call from David Fincher at that time, and uh, I proceeded to read him the riot act about <laughs> cutting me out of it in the first place, and why the fuck would I want to help him out for any reason, you know? <laughs> Didn't know he would go on to become an Academy <laughs> Award winning director. <laughs> Very, 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 very talented man. But at the time, I was full of oats, and you know, and uh, so I, you know, I told him no. I just told him no, you know. And uh, basically, what happened was then they asked if they could use a photo of me, a likeness of me, you know, and then they would just tell the story that we died in hypersleep. And they offered me some money, a lot of money actually, about half of what I got paid to do the original Aliens. And uh, so I said, okay. <laughs> but the, th the thing about it is that it's interesting because, you know, was I disappointed? Yes. But, you know, I got into that movie on a fluke, you know, and I didn't get into three because of whatever reason. I I'm not sure. So I was very disappointed, but it was... Um, you know, in Hollywood, sometimes it's just the luck of the draw. So I got in on a, on a fluke in the first place. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. I know, I know. But even four hours would not be enough with this man, right? So, uh, well, first of all, thank you for putting us together.